Hello and welcome to this episode of the John Cat Author Podcast. My name's Tom Sherrington and I'm delighted to be presenting this episode where I had the privilege of talking to the fantastic writer and thinker E.D. Hirsch about his new book, How to Educate a Citizen, subtitled The Power of Shared Knowledge to Unify a Nation. Now, Dylan William says about this book, if you are familiar with Hirsch's work, the arguments here are clearer, sharper, and yes, more impassioned. If you are not, and if you're interested in improving education anywhere in the world, then you really need to read this book from cover to cover. Dan Willingham, Professor of Psychology at the University of Virginia, says, Hirsch makes a compelling case that the contemporary political chasms in America and our ongoing educational doldrums have same root cause, a lack of common learning that allows communication and understanding. Now, E.D. Hirsch, Donald Hirsch, is really on a mission with this book, and it was a real joy to talk to him. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. Let us know what you think. And if you want to go and get yourself a copy of the book, johncatbookshop.com is the place to go. So enjoy the conversation and we will look forward to your response. Okay, well, thank you uh, to everyone joining us, uh, whether you're watching live or, or on a recording. It's a real privilege for me to be talking to Donald Hirsch, E.D. Hirsch, famous for... Uh, a, a number of books over the years, and uh, I, I'm going to actually ask you, Don, to t tell us a bit about about some of those things. But um, you've just published this amazing book, How to Educate a Citizen, which I'm going to show a picture of here, and it's absolutely fascinating. I've, I've been reading it intensively for the last week since I got sent a copy, and it feels like you're on a bit of a mission. It's so it's so impassioned, uh, and it feels like you're really kind of like back in the table. <laughs> so. Uh, Whereas the, the, the last book was, dare I say, a little bit more measured, um, you know, why knowledge matters. So what, what's happened in the last four years? What, why have we got this new kind of zeal? Well, uh, you, you've noticed uh, perhaps that if you've kept track of PISA, you know, the Program for International Student Assessment, uh, the Americans have been dropping each, each successive PISA report has... Uh, the, the American 15 year olds, I can't remember, is it 15 or 13 years old that PISA does, but in any case, uh, the end of elementary uh, schooling. So it's a kind of measure of how good your elementary schools are uh, in a nation, really. And uh, the American scores keep dropping. And so that's quite alarming. Excuse me, I have to turn up my. Uh, Yeah, nice, nice. Sorry about that. Shine with alarming. Yes, yeah, so, so that was really very alarming. So, 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 uh, so uh, yes. I mean, things have gotten worse, both educationally and politically in the, in the USA, and and you worry about uh, an educated citizenry, as it were, in a in a democracy. It's very fundamental, obviously. So do you feel, I mean, I've been asked this by a couple of people to, to, to reference what's very current in, in the US and we hear about it in, in, in the UK and we probably have similar issues. So you have this whole Trump, Trump uh, administration and he himself is talking about fake news the whole time. And yeah. a, a, frag, a kind of fragmentation, very polarized politics. Exactly. Is that part yeah. of you, the, the background? Yes, I mean, that and the, as, you, as I say, the continued decline of uh, verbal scores in, in the United States are saying that uh, we're not doing this very well. And, uh, and so it's getting, it, it, it's getting uh, quite serious for the nation. And uh, so that animated this book uh, quite a lot. So I'm, but I have to say, Tom, if I, if I may, yeah. what really animated the book and got me going was some of the new work in science. And uh, I don't know whether you plan to deal with that, but to me, it's kind of earth-shaking uh, uh, findings in, in the scientific community. Yeah, I, I was definitely going to come into that. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in how you come at this from different angles. So you've got this agenda, and towards the end of the book, you talk about nationalism and patriotism are not dirty words and you do have this sort of 
uh, idea about a nation state being really important and how that's founded on the commonality. So that's quite a key theme. But then that also dovetails with, with the science. So I, I think that's fascinating that, it, that both of these angles lead you to the same conclusion about a common curriculum. So right. we, we could start with one or the other. What, what's the whole agenda? Tell, tell us about the science. Let's go straight in. What, what's the science from your perspective? Well, uh, of course, there, there are a couple of uh, past uh, findings in science that have animated my work. One is that there's no such thing as a general skill. Every, everybody talks about uh, we're teaching critical thinking skills. It's all right to have a very dispersed uh, curriculum. And of course, that turns out to be false. There isn't any such thing as a general skill. All skills are domain specific. Uh, but the, uh, and that was, that science has animated my past work. That and, and the finding that background knowledge that you don't hear and see uh, is absolutely critical to understanding the words you, you read or the words you hear. And the other, the new science, though, is, comes from brain studies. And they've found out quite a lot about this question, uh, whether we're born with a kind of inborn blueprint, like uh, most animals are, that, that develops um, properly uh, into the way the mature animal should act and be or whether we're a total blank slate, as it were, that needs to be instructed in, in the uh, knowledge of the tribe. And in fact, uh, what this brain science has determined is that yes, we're born with a blank slate. Uh, there, all, all this emphasis on bringing out the inward nature of the child uh, in a natural way, in a developmental way, the whole idea of intellectual development as parallel to physical development, which of course is obviously the case, it turns out, no, nature is saying, uh, you have to pay attention to culture, or as the Ten Commandments put it, honor thy mother and father. Don't, <laughs> don't try to <laughs> launch out for yourself. So that's a tremendously important finding. Uh, and in fact, it should shake up once its implications become clear that Rousseau was wrong, Locke was right uh, uh, about the mind being a blank slate. That's tremendously important because, it, and it also throws a particular duty on, on parents and teachers. If it's a blank slate, you have a formative responsibility. Yes, yeah, so I noticed that you, you know, you cite the studies from, you know, Kirshner and John Sweller and people and talking about um, the need for guided instruction and those sorts of findings. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, well, that's another issue. Yes, that's another important scientific issue, uh, technically, for the way teachers are taught. Uh, that is, uh, in the educational community in the United States, there's a high emphasis on uh, uh, discovery learning, on uh, constructivism, as, as the general point is called. And uh, that turns out uh, uh, to be a myth as well. Uh, so <laughs> there's, yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of science uh, that needs to be retaught in, in American schools of education. Um, where the, uh, so many of the doctrines that our teachers are taught are simply incorrect. Uh, and it goes right down the line. And, and I, I think it's enormously important to pay attention to what science is saying. There's a kind of intellectual disgrace that there should be a, a, a difference between the science that's taught in education training, uh, teacher training schools. And yeah science that taught in main in mainline psychology departments it's it's unacceptable so it's interesting because you, you you do that you have this whole chapter where you talk about you know you, you sort of problematize the whole thing in the early part of the book and then you start looking at solutions towards the end and you know one of the things is to talk about uh teacher training institutions because you, you're sort of suggesting from your perspective that yeah a lot of the problems begin there. <laughs> so well, if you're running a teacher training, so how, how can you persuade teacher training institutes to, to change toward in the direction that you'd like them to? Well, I, my, <laughs> my hope is that if you educate the general public, and after all, if you also educate the teachers who are 
on the scene um, a little bit about what the realities are, what science has really determined, then there'll be pressure on the education schools not to teach junk science. And uh, unfortunately, though, um, well, I just encountered an example of it. I, I don't want to take too much of our precious time. But uh, when they do these uh, general studies, so we've examined 35 uh, studies, and they all show that something like concept maps work wonderfully. And you have one study that appears in Science Magazine, which is a well-refereed scientific uh, journal. And it says this is all nonsense. And that uh, study, which is a very uh, uh, carefully, uh, you know, with uh, all the proper controls in the work, uh, it, that study is ignored because it doesn't fit in to the to the general report about how wonderful concept maps are. Well, it, that's the kind of thing. It's it's intellectually unacceptable to have a really good piece of scientific work ignored, so and, and the lousy science is is. So these things are debated, aren't they? I mean, we, we have the same debates in England around research and yeah. how it's interpreted and whether there are no absolute truths to be found. But I, I think it's interesting that, you know, there must be thousands of uh, teacher training institutes a, a across the US. Ha, ha, what's the process for getting a kind of consensus even at that level? I, I, I really don't know. I really <laughs> don't know. I, there was a report by uh, a, a chap who was... Uh, a head of teachers college, his name was uh, Levine, I forget his first name. And uh, he, uh, when he retired, reported in despair that uh, uh, his teacher college and teachers colleges in general in the United States operated on ideology rather than re real research. Sorry well, I, about that. No, don't worry, honestly. <laughs> this is the real life. It's 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 great. So I mean, so interesting. So there's teacher training to look at if you uh, to, to to deal with things. But one of the things I'm fascinated in the book, and it's it's like it, I like the contrasting ways that you try to make your case. So you have the data. You're looking at, at data trends in the U.S. with PISA, and you look you look at France and 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 other places. But you also have this sort of quite detailed, you know, ethnographic sort of anecdotal. Uh, stuff so you've got a, a quite an extensive exchange with um, a couple of teachers uh, so people who haven't seen the book yet you're going to meet uh, Kathy and Michelle and you, you interview Kathy and Michelle for you know over many many pages then describing their experience of working in a kind of knowledge based school and a kind of a student child centered school. Well, they were that, kind of like they were kind of like that figure uh, in Greek mythology Tiresias who spent half of his life as a woman and half of his life as a man. And of course, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was that embarrassing question of who enjoys sexual intercourse more, uh, the man or the, or the woman. And anyway, the, the answer so infuriated one of the gods that uh, they blinded Tiresias. Anyway, uh, that, <laughs> I, I, that was in the back of my mind, sort of as I interviewed these two teachers, because they had spent half of their career in a child-centered classroom and half of their career in a knowledge-centered uh, classroom. And they were such enthusiasts for the knowledge-centered classroom, it was quite fascinating. And so I didn't have to say very much, I just asked the questions and it was quite illuminating, I have to say. Because you know the history of uh, what happened in the child-centered classroom in the United States, uh, in the 40s, they pulled up all the screwed down little desks facing the front of the room, and then teachers began to be told, you shouldn't be a sage on the stage, you should be a guide on the side, and the, and the chairs were all moved around. And now, in American elementary schools, there are no desks anymore. The, the, the uh, students, the young uh, students sit around uh, big tables and face each other and do their own individual projects. So. The difference between that kind of a classroom, which is uh, very differentiated, as they say, um, and, and a knowledge-centered classroom, is that everybody is learning the same thing, pretty much. 
uh, in the same sequence. Uh, and Tom, there's a more general point of, the, of not just classroom arrangements. The more general point is equity. If, if, you, if you run that kind of child-centered classroom, uh, what you're not doing is creating a speech community in the classroom. And that, I would say, is from a practical standpoint, the most important scientific finding is that if you cannot have excellence and equity in education unless the classroom becomes a speech community so that the speech that is going on in the classroom is understood by all the kids. That, uh, that's such a, a fundamental uh, issue uh, for any nation's education, it seems to me. If you want fairness and quality, you, you've got to arrange it so that everybody is understanding what the teacher and the other students are saying. And it, that's where that elemental insight, scientific insight that started me off originally comes in. It's, it's the finding that unheard, unseen background knowledge is absolutely essential to what you hear and see and read. Uh, in understanding that language, understanding that speech. So, so if I say, Polly, put the kettle on, you've got to know, put the kettle on what? <laughs> and what's in the kettle? Hmm? And so if you don't know that, you're excluded. If you do know, then you understand what, what's going on. So if you want all children to understand what's being said and what's being done in the classroom. You have to have a sequence of knowledge so that what you're saying is built on the knowledge that they already have, so that the kids have the background knowledge that they need to understand language itself. So that makes, that makes total sense in, at the level of a, of a classroom, and I, and I think that's great. And I mean, it's, it's absolutely clear to me, you know, right back from your earlier books mm -hmm. about this, your mm -hmm. desire to, for it to be driven by a, a vision of equity and I think that's very right. strong but I what, I what I think is interesting then is is that we get into this thing straight away so there's a very specific example that you give there and there are so many more you know Polly put the kettle on uh, we all have tea and that so yeah but yeah. then that's just one piece in, in some of the, the, the material that I, I've picked up from uh, I reference this in, 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 in one of my things I just thought it was fascinating in the core knowledge um, program that you've run them not that you actually specify some specifics like I looked up some things to do with music and there you have you know uh, sixth grade they should be learning classical music from the baroque to romantic seventh grade <laughs> classical music romantics and nationalist Brahms Berlioz list eighth grade and so on and it's very you really get in I mean on the core knowledge website you really get into the detail of saying beyond the, the general idea that children should know similar things are saying well maybe this should be what they should learn but you the, the big question I've been asked this by several people who decides like who gets to choose that what's on that list well actually in the, I, I think in every society there's going to be a, 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 perhaps a different answer to that question but in the USA um, what the conclusion I come to in, in this book is you don't go to some a uh, character like me who goes and asks uh, a, a lot of different people, uh, well, what do you think? The, and, and by the way, when we made that list, there were mostly teachers were in, involved as my mm. uh, correspondents. Uh, no, the, the way things run in the USA, and, I don't, and there isn't anything particularly comparable in Britain, is uh, the state, the individual state, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, New York. Each one of those states has uh, responsibility for education and responsibility for setting what they call standards, the standards for each grade in, um, in elementary schools. And right now those standards are empty because of the theories that are, that are prominent, as you know, the, the skills mm -hmm. theory, as it were which is an incorrect theory. And so my suggestion was that the states 
uh, that you have to get the general public on board on this issue that there has to be commonality in order for there to be equity and excellence. And so once the general public in a democracy understands that, then they say to their legislators and their governor in a, in a state, you people have to produce. And so it becomes a, a political, a general political issue. And it presumably it's, it's, it's uh, decided uh, democratically. But you, but in the, in the United States, it has to be decided ultimately by the people who have the authority, which is the state, the governor and the legislature in each individual state. And they, right now, they produce something called standards. And of course, they're all empty. They need to fill them up and, uh, and make yeah, it Yeah, well, I get so it's, And it's so interesting that, you know, when you see something written down, and, and to me, that list is, you know, you could, you could debate various uh, specific composers, but it's strange. And another one would, would say, um, you know, the core classics, and there's a whole list of those. And one of them is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Selected Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And it even goes into some of the things that you might do to explore um, Holmes compared with heroes from epic fiction and all this sort of stuff is, and when you're reading the detail, you're thinking you really mean it. But then it, how important is it, do you think, for that to be uh, expanded to a very large group of people across a, a state or a nation rather than, a, say, a community? Level? Oh, I think it's very important that you, uh, that you don't make it so... Uh, Anglo-centric, uh, as as my original list was, and uh, even the the Core Knowledge Foundation is trying to broaden itself out just to make everybody feel inclusive. But the general argument on that point uh, that uh, the book makes is that there there is such a thing as a national ethnicity. Uh, that whole term ethnicity. Is a, is a term that has to be rethought by many people because people talk about black culture, Anglo culture in the United States, that sort of thing. But if the brain science is right, there is no such thing as, as black or white or brown culture. A black or white or brown baby is born with a blank slate. And, and that blank slate can have more than one culture. And in fact, uh, many people do have more than one culture. So it, it seems to me that the, then the question is, since everybody can have more than one culture, wouldn't it be a good idea if there was also a common culture in a nation and you called yourself, well, we're British or well, we're uh, Americans and, and you have an American culture as well as whatever else. Of the culture so that, that sounds so. It's, it's so you're not sort of that's interesting. I think that's an important point to sort of state that you're not suggesting that this is sort of in a way replacing people's identified cultures that they feel that they are, are important to them, but it's a sort of a layer uh, uh, overarching or underneath. That's true, but it, I, I don't want to uh, gloss over the, the, the fact that I also think patriotism is immensely important in a society. And, uh, well, put it another way, altruistic societies are better than selfish societies. They, they're stronger societies. And uh, th that goes across the animal, uh, uh, all, of the, all of the species that are known, including the human species. And, and so if, if you want an altruistic uh, society, uh, it has to be based on uh, the possibility of communication, good communications between the parties. Uh, that has a double effect. It's uh, the good communications make the society work more effectively and, uh, and efficiently and make everybody more prosperous. But also, if you have a communicative uh, society, it, it tends to be more uh, a society of, well, you know, the French... Uh, battle cry in the revolution, liberty, equality, fraternité. And if you take the uh, gender away from fraternité, you get uh, patriotism, you get, you get a sense that we are responsible for one another. That sentiment 
instead of the polarization that you now have in the United States, is what makes a, a strong society. And I think it's the duty of uh, uh, schools in a modern nation to encourage that kind of society, which you can encourage by having a national ethnicity uh, that, uh, that, as it were, make, makes you all uh, brothers and sisters. So it's interesting. I, I, I think this is a fascinating uh, idea. But in, in a way, I feel like you no. Know, the question is, can we? There's, we feel like there's a kind of divergence away from what, the, what that, that used to be there for for a number of reasons. And, and you're suggesting we kind of almost try to come back to it. But where it's happened, and you cite places like Singapore, you, you've got a, a fairly small population, relatively, with a quite a strongly centralised government apparatus, and they can produce. And some of the detail towards the end of your book, you go into some of the details of the way that Singapore spells out its curriculum for elementary schools there. Mm -hmm. And this, this is what you must learn. And it's very, very tight and very, but also feels like a, a, a solid set of things to learn. It's, it's not even that contentious, but it's definitely, but even if that used to be, I love the story about how that used to be the case with some early readers that people used to generally all read and, uh, knowledge books in the US, spelling mm. and so on. I love that tale. But we're a long way from that now, aren't we? I mean, can we really go back to that where there's a, some central texts across the whole of the United States that everybody knows and loves and reads from? Yes, if the, if the state says you have to learn it and it's going to be on the test, uh, of course you can. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean that you're excluding a, a lot of us. The, that is the centrally shared uh, materials. Uh, it, I mean, my, my example is uh, you, uh, Toni Morrison, the, the, the black novelist in the United States, who's uh, wonderful, uh, is just, uh, <laughs> let's put that in place of Sherlock Holmes. Sure, absolutely. And, uh, but commonality is essential uh, to a society, to the, to the coherence of a society. And uh, this dispersive ideas, uh, particularly on my colleagues on the cultural left, as uh, Rorty called it, uh, are confused about the example of Switzerland. So I, I thought Switzerland was a marvelous thing. Said, well, they have four different languages and, and do very well, and there's a lot of patriotism, and everybody wants to look out for one another in Switzerland. And, uh, and so uh, that was an interesting example because a lot of the past work on multiculturalism and, and multicultural society used the example of Switzerland as, uh, yeah. as being a possibility. Uh, it, well, if you look into it more closely, the, the person who has studied it or talked about it mo most cogently was a, a political scientist back about 20 or 30 years ago named Karl Deutsch. He was a very fine scholar of, uh, of nationalism. It was called Nationalism and Social Communication. And what he showed was that the Swiss, <laughs> the Swiss can, a Swiss German can talk to a, a, a Frenchman, French, uh, I mean, a, a Swiss speaker of German can talk to a Swiss speaker of French and and they can communicate much better than the German could speak to somebody in Austria or in Germany because uh, the commu actual communication is based on shared background knowledge. So what the Swiss have is essentially uh, a universal curriculum in four different languages. Ah, yes. That, so that's, that, that's the basic situation. So uh, it's fascinating. It was a fascinating study because it really says what counts is commonality of background knowledge. The vehicle, the language, and so on, is not absolutely critical. And uh, I think that's a tremendous insight. So because, I mean, because it comes back to a common curriculum, which I take it, actually, the Swiss have, no matter the four different languages. So, so I mean, you go as far as saying things like, you know, you, you kind of, I don't know if it's romanticized is the right word, but you, you're positive about things like the, the Pledge of Allegiance and the singing the Star Spangled Banner in, in, on a daily basis because it creates a sense of nationhood. And do you- Yeah, well, and, and of, 
a sense of, of unity and commonality, fraternity, or, or brotherhood. But what I did say was we need an ungendered version of those words. <laughs> yeah. And what I, uh, what I came up with, it suddenly occurred to me, there was a school principal in the Bronx who talked about patriotism. And uh, she said, well, we tell all of our students in our elementary school to be kind to one another. And that's real patriotism, she said. And, and I thought, well, so if you look up the word kindness and kind, it's related to kin, it, from genus, uh, genus. Uh, it's, it means kind, it becomes from kind, it comes from kin. Kindness means how you treat members of your family, members of your own kind. And so the generic term kindness and the term brotherhood or fraternity or, or whatever, all saying the same thing. It's, it's the altruistic way you regard one another and treat one another. That's tremendously important in any country. It, it, I can see that. And I, I, I mean, one of the things that you've, the, the US has had um, you know, for a long time, and it's, it seems to be being challenged quite a lot in, under Trump, is the Constitution and the sense of a, a something which exists beyond the polemics of party politics, because it, and, and that's been obviously debated and refined over the decades. But we, you don't, do you feel like now it's, we're sort of even break, that's even starting to break up a bit, like that, that's being challenged and we're at a sort of precarious turning point? Well, I just shake my head over uh, the current uh, election because uh, I, f I see so many people who simply are unpatriotic. Uh, they're willing to, to do things that are bad for the society as a whole in order to get their own uh, power, uh, preserve their own power. And, and so, uh, it's a tremendously important election coming up in, in the U.S. And uh, it's, it's no, by no means certain who's going to, to win it, yeah. which, is a, which is a distressing fact in itself. So there you are. Yeah, I, I can see that. And of course, <laughs> so, I mean, we, I think it's, and I've, I've been asked by a couple of people to, to get, I mean, I don't know how, how, how particularly detailed you want to get into this, but Black Lives Matter has been a huge th thing in the US and, and, and over in the, in the UK as well. And we're discussing in England at the moment, you know, there's a debate around decolonizing the curriculum, as that's the phrase that's used. So well, British history, there's a lot, of, a lot of, you know, people putting down uh, statues of slave traders and all the rest of it for, you know, yeah. for, for good reason. And, but what, but we're not, what, what we're not sure yet, and there's no consensus around what does a decolonized curriculum look like? Do we all agree? And in fact, Actually, my experience so far is that, no, we really don't agree. <laughs> so. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you have to recognize uh, that general point that uh, I, I'm so glad that the brain scientists came along just in time to tell us that the brain of a black child and the brain of a white child are similarly blank slates. There, there's no such thing in, as inherently as black culture or white culture and so on. You just have to agree on some sort of uh, peaceful commonality of, uh, of a broad national culture, whatever it is. And uh, uh, there is a lot in this debate, there's a hell of a lot of confusion between race and culture. And, yeah. uh, and it shouldn't be. If you don't, if you don't disentangle those two terms, as we don't. I mean, the forms in the United States that go race, slant line, ethnicity. That's, so you're, we're supposed to fill in, I don't know, are there supposed to be two answers to that? And, and anyway, uh, uh, people are confused about this connection between race and ethnicity. Ethnicity means culture. Uh, there's, and the culture you gain is something that you learn. Uh, from childhood, it isn't something you're born with. So there's a, a race is an essential feature, something that's inborn. Culture is not. I, I think that's, I think that's probably a, a fairly straightforward idea in a way. But I, I think what what then happens is that you do grow up in a culture and you see yourself represented. And uh, I don't know what you think that's about this. But 
that Amer American history, for example, is it, is it the history of everyone who's American and, and with all the multiple roots into the citizenship? And, and Absolutely. Therefore, that sort yep. of story, the stories you need to tell to, to communicate right. American history are huge and varied. How, so how do we even deal with the scale of just history in American curriculum? Well, you, that's, up, that's why you need a curriculum, right? Uh, if you want to deal with it, you try to deal with that systematically and you get political agreement about it. Once you get polit real political agreement, then it's a peaceful solution to what is otherwise a hugely uh, contentious uh, uh, question or problem. But I do think once you disentangle race and culture, race and ethnicity, to, uh, ethnicity, culture are totally accidental features of, uh, of a society, of a, of a history. History is full of accidental uh, elements that nothing is essential about any of it. And, that's why I think the schools of a nation have a tremendous responsibility in getting a, a sense of commonality uh, in the nation itself if they're interested in their own self-preservation uh, as a nation. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think this, uh, the, the role of schools has got to be key. But then well, this is one of the things I find interesting, that even talking to a group of teachers uh, about, about curriculum and about um, ethnicity and identity within the curriculum representation in literature the historical stories right and those things because we debate and discuss you know it's you, you the people who then go and enact that curriculum in their classrooms have their own perspectives it, it feels like a long way to go to to really sum up to this idea that look we have to have a common curriculum and we're going to fight over it but there will be a common curriculum and then when we've agreed to it we have to teach that <laughs> and sort of park our perspectives a bit. I mean, do you think that's a, a realistic process to, to hope for? Well, uh, if people feel that's an issue of, self, of national self-preservation and national prosperity, uh, perhaps yes, perhaps uh, that's what has to get across. I, I mean, because it actually, if you don't have that, then that means you, you have a selfish culture rather than an altruistic culture. And if you have a selfish national culture with these different uh, elements and you don't have a really big, good, vital center, then uh, you're simply weakening yourself and you'll be taken over by the Chinese or, or whatever will happen. I mean, that, that's the lesson from, uh, <laughs> that's the lesson from history, but also from sociobiology. And uh, so in other words, you better form an altruistic society. And uh, with that in mind, just from the standpoint of self-preservation, you better do some of these things. But you have to be in that sense of, sense of mind that if we don't get together on this kind of thing, we're, we're really injuring ourselves tremendously as a, as a nation. So it, feel, it feels to me that what you're sort of suggesting is that we need a, we need a kind of um, a, a sort of political culture where, where, which is based on a coming together so that we can then lay the foundation for a, for the commonality which then builds the nation that around it and sort of and, and that's that's interesting isn't it so the turf war over what goes into the curriculum needs to come after the agreement to have the common curriculum I, I yes. think this is so interesting and I feel like we, we, when we get into the detail of what is then taught, we know we could discuss that. But I want to go back a bit to a couple other things because I think it's important to, to get this out in the book. This is your frustration that's not even there yet. What, one of the things I've been asked to ask you is, why, why is it so difficult to even have this conversation? Why is it so attractive to people to talk still about skills, creativity? Um, and obviously people like, you know, Sir Ken Robinson, who, who died just recently, you know, very sadly, but he, he's a hugely popular advocate for almost the opposite to what you're saying, but maybe it's not the opposite, but it sometimes is characterized as such. So how, why is it so attractive to people to talk about these ideas like creativity and skills and child-centeredness? Well, I, there are two groups uh, for whom it's attractive for different reasons, it seems to me. To the people in charge of uh, making curricula, it's tremendously attractive. They don't have to make any decisions. And uh, so 
you know, you follow nature, follow the individual characteristics of the child and so on. Uh, saying that gets the, uh, the central office off the hook. And uh, so decisions don't have to be made. So it's very attractive bureaucratically, but it's also very attractive to uh, what I would call the romantic set of mind, which is each child is an individual and you need to nurture that individuality uh, in the child so it develops according to its own nature. But that idea, which is almost a religious idea, uh, that, that is, this is what mm -hmm. the God-given characteristics of the child are, that idea is uh, now an exploded idea when it comes to, well, what is the actual nature of that child? The actual nature is, well, sure, the child has a certain temperament, but as far as what sort of uh, elements it should learn, it should learn the lore of the tribe. That, I think a, a, a book I mentioned in my own book is uh, Harari's uh, yeah. widely read book called Sapiens. Yeah, which, amazing book. Which, which traces essentially the dominance of the human species over other species, including huge mastodons and so, uh, because they got together as a group and formed a formidable organism as a group, that, so that culture actually is what made Homo sapiens. And it turns out that Homo sapiens actually has a brain cell, the, uh, the, uh, the so-called roset neuron, that's different from any other creature. It, it, and it's almost as though it's saying, you're the culture animal. That's why you're going to be victorious. And not to see that that's almost, that that's really what nature is saying. It's saying that. It's, it's, it's talking about the tribe, the group, uh, from an evolutionary standpoint. Yeah. It's not focused on that individual child and individual nature. So, I, so it's attractive to people. And I think one of the things I, I sense is that people's, in a way, it's the, around the definition of the tribe and how big it can be to be really co coherent and sustained. And maybe some nations are just too big. Maybe states yes. work better, districts. And it's then within, there's layers of commonality. So even defining what Britishness means or, you know, being an American, yeah. there's, there's layers. So is it, so one of the things I'm interested in is this, like even, even when you get down to say, uh, we all should read certain texts, but how, you know, even if we could agree them, there, there, there are so many thousands of books that kids could read. Isn't it better for them to, you know, for there to be a plurality of, of ideas uh, so that you, you have a kind of wider gene pool, if you like, of, of cultural references, which you well, can the, each other with? It, isn't the answer to that to make the the, the national curriculum uh, big enough to form national communicability and national kindness, so to speak? And that's one thing, uh, but there's plenty of room for other things. And and so I think what you're asking is, shouldn't the national curriculum not be all inclusive, not not take up it? every element of schooling. Well, of course I agree with that. And it, it, so there's, there's going to be a compromise between individualism and, and community. But in the states, there has, it's shifted far too far in favor of individualism and identity and so on. Uh, identities which, by the way, are invented and formed. You have no identity to start with. And, and identities can change yeah, and, and you should change. That's what schooling is for. It's, it's true and it's part of it. And uh, you know, you, you, when, you, when you have children, you realize that they, they take on some of your, your culture is, but they, they pick it up, they form their own right. and it's evolving all the time, which is another thing. So obviously, you know, we're, this is, it's dynamic, isn't it? So a core curriculum is dynamic, it's not static. And that reflects changing right. society. What's your view about globalization in that context? So with a global, globalization is a reality in terms of communication and so on. Does that, does that change things? Because we're, 
we can we can exist as a whole species to some extent. Well, you've got that right. I mean, you raise a number of points there. Uh, but is there a limit to what a feasible? Uh, well, I think history has thrown up some pretty interesting points on that score, and that is the empires that have a lot of countries with different uh, languages do not work. They collapse. Uh, the British Empire collapsed, Rome collapsed, the Soviet Empire collapsed. Uh, why? On the other hand, nations seem to persist. They persist in a hell of a long time. And uh, I, there's a wonderful passage. I, uh, I'm going to put it up. I'm going to get a website and put it up. There's a, mm. a, there's a, a recently discovered essay by the great uh, sociologist Emil Durkheim. Uh, and uh, I translated it, it, it was uh, published in a, in a French sociological journal. Uh, Durkheim uh, thought the nation state is the biggest uh, society you, you can have. And uh, I, I, he's very interesting on, on that point. On the other hand, he's very much for patriotism and patria and uh, as being the focus of, uh, of society and education because it's part of modernity in his uh, general view of history. And nations have been pretty persistent, it seems to me, with national languages and so on. So uh, I wouldn't give up on the nation state, or even a big one, uh, as long as it can be coherent. And uh, that depends on your educational theory. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> I, I suppose one, one, of the, one of the things that needs to, I don't know, and this is my, my sense of what, of what the challenge is, is that the more fragmented a society gets, or if people feel marginalised and that they'd have an unfair deal in that society, yes. they, stop, they stop trusting the kind of, the sort of, the kind of benevolence of the, the political centre. And so they start to rejecting that sense of imposition of a centralised curriculum mm. and other ideas. So isn't, that, isn't it incumbent then on a society to be more inclusive in its outlook in order to even sustain that idea of commonality? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, my hope, uh, I mean, one, one way you can look at it is there has to be a deliberate um, inclusiveness uh, in, in the curriculum so that everybody uh, feels at home, feels part of the society. Uh, but also, once everybody has been included over a couple of generations, you do have uh, this other culture, this British inclusive culture, call it, not just Anglo, but very inclusive. Give it another name if you like. Uh, the Americans are useful in that, uh, ha, ha, call themselves America and, um, um, uh, and uh, an American culture. That's what I'm, I'm thinking needs to happen in the States, that term. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that it, it, nobody calls American an ethnicity for some reason. And uh, I think <laughs> that should change in our country. I noticed that you quote Tony Morrison about getting rid of the hyphen. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. And that, well, that's something that hadn't really occurred to me. And, and sometimes yeah. there's a pride and people have an identity around being African-American and that's their identity. And you're yeah. saying that yeah. we need to get rid of those. So look, there's, yeah. there's, there's something else I wanted to talk to you about, which is we are, we're going to run out of time soon. But this is whole issue to do with, it's like it's moving slightly to other areas of the curriculum possibly, but around expertise. And, and I think one of, the, one of the debates we have in, in the UK around say say what makes a good science curriculum and and there's lots of issues around people's understanding of climate change or vaccination and all the rest of it which you think if people understood the science better <laughs> they wouldn't have these debates but there's an expert body there which represents the majority of scientists who hopefully feed that into the curriculum but we also have experts in lots of other domains including history and including literature and music as a, and they form a community of, of specialists. So what, what's their role in influencing a common curriculum beyond the kind of political domain? Well, I should think their role is to say, you want to make sure that 
first class science and first class scholarship is dominates in what you teach. You're not teaching hocus pocus science. I mean, in science, it's very straightforward. Uh, teach the stuff that gets published in highly respected, highly refereed journals, not the stuff that gets published in educational journals in the United States, which aren't really um, properly vetted. And uh, so that's the science, but I, you, you're not going to get any disagreement on science. On history, historians, of course, are going to tell you there's a, a lot of different approaches to that subject. And so uh, if you can get some, well, in history, it's a question of inclusiveness. What do you include and, uh, and what do you, 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 you can have tendentious history, which says we're all headed downhill or we're all headed uphill towards a, a, a bright new future. You can, uh, but, and, and, and unfortunately, that's of course the way history is, will continue to be because that's a matter of interpretation. But as to what is included factually, let me just give you an example. I grew up in the American South. I grew up for my entire life uh, up through age 16, I guess, when I went off, or 17, whenever I went off to college, um, in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, you've got to imagine the level of racism in, I was born in uh, 1928. And uh, so I grew up in a, I had never heard the name Frederick Douglass. Now, I, I don't know how many in Britain know much about Frederick Douglass, but he's one of the most remarkable figures in American history. And, uh, but he happened to be black. And he happened to have mastered from his own brilliance uh, uh, the culture and language of blacks, and he was one of the most dynamic orators. He escaped from slavery. He was one of the most dynamic orators. Uh, his period of, of flourishing was in the 1850s to the 1880s, 1870s. So, so uh, he, he, that was, I never heard that name. Mm. Uh, I mean, he's this really remarkable figure in American history. That was the way it was in the American South back then. It was a, a completely racially filtered uh, history. And of course, all that's terrible, it's, uh, terrible, but we've made tremendous progress in the States in that respect. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, history is, is up for it's grabs. For it always has been. But we go into this period, aren't we, where expertise is discussed and you know debated and questioned, and, and around even like a, a virus because there's debates. And I, I, I actually think there's there's lots more I could I, I could talk to you for a long, long time. Uh, there's, there's one more question I, I'm going to ask, which actually comes from a guy called Richmond Vernon from Florida, and he, he on Twitter he gave us the question. He he was saying, how do, how do you motivate people who aren't in education professionally to see how important a knowledge based curriculum is. And, and how do we get that message out? <laughs> That's a question I'm asking you, Tom, <laughs> because uh, I wish I knew. I, I write books, I, and I also am 92, I plead. Uh, in a very, you look very good on 92. Are you, do you feel optimism? Because I, I started off by saying that you have this sort of like you know, fist you know, <laughs> thumping on the table zeal around this book. But do, do you feel optimistic, uh, if, if, if this is your last book, you know, do, is it, do you feel optimistic that things will change? Uh, well, yes, I, I mean, that's what keeps me going. But, uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, things haven't changed. And uh, so we'll have to wait and see. I, I, I have a, a skeptical optimism. <laughs> that's probably quite a healthy frame of mind i mean I, I have to say that you know your work and your presence in the, in the education sphere is is very very important and um it's made a lot of people think hard about even everything to do from reading to curriculum design and your name comes up constantly um and i'm going to say a huge thank you on behalf of people listening and who are watching later
for your contribution. And this book is uh, a really, you know, a, it's about elementary schools in the US, but it's got huge uh, resonance for our debates we're having in, in England uh, and, and UK wide, more widely. So can I just say thank you to everyone listening. I'm going to, you know, I'll do the sales pitch, but really this book here, uh, How to Educate a Citizen, it really is a book. It's important for people to read it. And I hope that you go and get a copy, discuss it in your schools. Uh, and once again, on behalf of John Katz, a huge thank you to Don Hirsch for your time uh, and best wishes for, you know, what you're doing. And I really hope that you, your book does really well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for those nice words. So that was E.D. Hirsch talking to me, Tom Sherrington, about Don's fantastic book, How to Educate a Citizen. It was an incredible conversation. Lots of things to stir up some discussion at school, some quite controversial ideas in there, I would say, but also just that sense of passion and his really obvious sense of a, a, a striving for equity in education. I think that came across so well. But it's all... Fuel and food for thought, and I'm sure um, some great debates to follow from that. So get yourself to johncatbookshop.com if you want to get yourself a copy, and listen out for further episodes of this podcast where other authors will be talking to authors about their most recent books. So thank you for joining us on this occasion, and we'll see you another time. Thank you. Mm-hmm.